we want to start our uh, coursework right away. Uh, as you have seen in your uh, agenda, uh, I'm going to start today's uh, talk with uh, hindrances. You have heard of them many times, probably you might have read in many places, in uh, uh, texts, commentaries, sub-commentaries, and other people's writings. And you yourself might have experienced them quite a lot, and therefore it may not be difficult for you to relate to these uh, uh, hindrances. I want to <coughs> spend more time on uh, using the Buddha's own uh, words uh, in describing, explaining uh, these hindrances. Most of the people are very familiar with the commentarial material. Uh, that is sort of uh, in popular Buddhism. Uh, all you see, uh, mostly actually, uh, commentarial description, explanation, and uh, uh, method of uh, methods of overcoming uh, hindrances. But I do. I want to dwell upon the Buddha's own words from uh, texts, so that we can see what Buddha himself has said about these uh, hindrances. Uh, number one, as you have seen in your uh, Mahasatipatthana, Buddha mentioned five hindrances. I want to draw your attention to other very important sources. One is uh, Samanya Pala Sutta in uh, Diganikaya, and the other is uh, <coughs> Satipatthana Sutta number 10 in uh, Majjhiminikaya. In uh, uh, many other places, uh, Buddha has mentioned these five hindrances, and also he gave very beautiful, very vivid, very clear similes to explain each of these hindrances. Number one is uh, uh, sense desires. When we talk about sense desires, we don't mean only sex desires. Sense desires means a desire for all sensual uh, desire. Desire through our uh, desire to see objects, hear sounds, smell smells, taste things, touch things, and think of various things that arouse our craving, greed. And that is called karma chanda. Karma, karma means uh, desire. Chanda means uh, Desire also, karma means to please, to enjoy. Uh, chanda means desire. Desire to entertain, maintain these supports, these thoughts that arise in our mind. As you know, hindrances are all mental states. We don't see that many uh, physical hindrances in the five hindrance, hindrances, they all are mental. And therefore, Buddha dealt with them uh, directly, giving very uh, vivid similes. Sensual desire is compared to several things, compared to uh, using borrowed article. When you borrow articles, you always feel obligated to return it, if you are honest. 
Suppose you borrow a book from a library. Unless you practice bookkeeping, you have obligation to return it. And you always think if each time you read the book, you think this is not my book. I must return this. There is a joke about it. Somebody said, uh, don't loan books to anybody. All the books that I have in my library are the books that I borrowed. I never returned. So he built the entire library by borrowed books. And therefore his advice to other people is don't loan a book. <laughs> In the, when you honestly practice Dhamma, <coughs> this practice keeps bugging our mind. Sense pleasure is like that. We always feel obligated, honestly, if, we are, if our intention is to cleanse the mind, purify the mind, see the uh, clarity, and the, the power of clear and pure state of mind, we always have this obligation to ourselves. We are obliged to let go of this Imped impediment, this uh, what you call hindrance. Second uh, simile Buddha gave is uh, uh, a colored water. When water is colored of mixed with various colors, you know, red, uh, blue, uh, pink, uh, black, and, you know, purple, uh, yellow, and so forth, you cannot see the bottom of that water, of the container. Similarly, when the mind is filled with desire, mind cannot see things properly. This also is very uh, vivid uh, simile. Uh, because of this hindrance, many people get into trouble. They first uh, uh, either see something, hear something, smell something, taste something, and touch something, or think of something. And that appears to the person to be pleasant, attractive, beautiful, pleasing, promising, and the person thinks, this is what I want. This is the person I should live with. This is the place where I go. This is the thing I eat. This is the smell I must have. This is the sound I should have. So, because of this uh, notion, this attraction, People get involved in various things, places, situations, persons, ideas, and so forth. And that becomes, that makes the mind unclear. Because in the first place, one uh, gets involved not with clear understanding, but because of this uh, superficial appearance of something, people get confused and uh, get involved, and that becomes a hindrance. The second hindrance is the ill will. Ill will is compared to two things also. Uh, one is uh, actually three things. One is boiling water. When water is boiling, you cannot touch it. You cannot get close to it. Similarly, when, the, when we are full of uh, anger or hatred, ill will, it's very difficult for somebody to approach us or for us to approach somebody with that state of mind. 
and therefore it becomes a hindrance. Second simile is uh, a simile of a uh, uh, piece of log taken from a cemetery where it has been both ends of the piece of wood is are, um, are burnt and turn dark, turn into a, a charred, like charcoal. But the, and, the, and the middle is smeared with dirt. So both ends of the stick are like are charred, like charcoal. The middle is filled with dirt, so nobody can touch it. These days people said, why not we use a thong or gloves and carry it. <laughs> of course, that is another thing you got to do. Uh, that is, we come to that later on. But uh, with your bare hand, you cannot, you don't like to touch that piece of wood without your hand getting dirty. Similarly, when somebody is very angry, that person himself, within himself, is like that piece of wood, dirty and uh, uh, unpleasant. And another person cannot associate with that person. That person also feels very uncomfortable. Uh, everybody detests that person, loathes and that person, try to avoid that person, stay away from that person. Third simile, or for the to illustrate the uh, ill will, also is very beautiful simile. That is like when you are sick you cannot appreciate food. You are, suppose you are suffering from uh, uh, jaundice or hepatitis. Then you cannot taste food. Any delicious food may taste like bland. You shun it as I say, this is bland. Because your taste bud has been affected by the, by the disease, sickness. Similarly, when the mind is filled with anger, you can never appreciate anything in the world. There may be, you know, you may have seen this. I know some people, myself, who never say anything good about anybody in the world. I am pretty sure you must have come across people like that. If you talk to that person, the very first reaction is no. No matter how beautiful thing you suggest to such a person, the first reaction is no. Flatly reject, refuse. So you go to talk to the person to convince him how right it is, how good it is then slowly the person may accept it. But the first response is negative. Because if that person cannot see somebody else's good things, in somebody, somebody else's good opinion, good suggestions, good proposals, good work, they can never appreciate. Why? The mind is sick. <laughs> filled with anger. It may not manifest so uh, conspicuously, more cle very clearly, but uh, the, who, the, it is there in the person's, the person's personality is such that the person cannot appreciate anything. These three similes are equally very good similes to illustrate the the way how anger operates. Third hindrance
Uh, yeah. Uh, Just the outside. Inside may be good of the, in the center, but who likes to hold that stick with bare hand? The third simile is the sleepiness and drowsiness. Third hindrance. Uh, I think you may experience it every day. Even during this course, you will experience that. <laughs> Other hindrances, perhaps, may you may, you know, try to overcome. They may not be that active. But when you come to meditation, listen to Dharma talks, and especially when it is given by the same person or <laughs> repeating, perhaps repeating the same thing over and over again. And moreover, when you are tired, you will have this hindrance, sleepiness and drowsiness. Mm. You know, some people in the commentary and so forth, Buddha never tried to break these two in the way they are broken in commentaries and sub-commentaries. In the commentaries and sub-commentaries, sleepiness and drowsiness are broken into two hindrances as one is mental sluggishness and the other is uh, mind content sluggishness. Chitta and Cheta Sika. In the sutras you will never find this kind of definitions. As I said, when I want to stick with the Buddha's own words, Buddha simply says, these are sleepiness and drowsiness. When sleepiness arises, how can you make the distinction between mind state and mental state? You are sleepy. Drowsiness, sleepiness is inside, drowsiness is physical. This physical body becomes you know, sluggish. That is the drowsiness. Sleepiness is the beginning and drowsiness is the result. It, these two always go together. When you are sleepy, you definitely are drowsy. <clears throat> and drowsiness is not mental state. Drowsiness is physical, but begin, begins in the mind. When it begins in the mind, it is sleepiness, and it manifests through the body as drowsiness. Uh, if it is purely mental, you know, like uh, mind state and mental st mind, uh, 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 chitta and chetasika, that is. Uh, consciousness and uh, mind contents, then it will remain confined only to the mind. Body will simply be active. This body cannot be active when the mind becomes drowsy, sleepy. And therefore, perhaps for this reason, you can never see in sutras Buddha define sleepiness and drowsiness in the way defined, it is defined in uh, commentaries. Mahathir, is it a cause and effect then? Right. So maybe they, <coughs> they mean that the cheta sikas are involved in the physical manifestation perhaps? Sure, sure. So sleepiness, it begins with the mental state and then other cheta sikas come in. Other things come in. The manifestation. Yeah, other things manifest. So, uh, it, com it is compared to being in the prison. When you are in, in jail, in, in prison, uh, all the doors and windows are closed, it is dark inside, you cannot see what is going on outside. You are in prison. That is simile number one. Number two is uh, muddy water. 
when the water is muddy, even if it is a very uh, shallow pool of water, it appears to be deep because you cannot see the bottom. When uh, similarly, when the mind is filled with uh, sleepiness and drowsiness, you are so your mind is so cluttered, confused, you cannot see things very clearly. Then the, the, the fourth, semi, fourth hindrance is restlessness and worry. These two, these also go together as a pair. Uh, actually, it should be worry and restlessness. Although it is put in the, in the way it is, restlessness and worry. Uddhacha kukucha. Kukucha uddhacha. It should be kukucha uddhacha. But for the uh, reading, pronunciation, uh, convenience, it is called Uddhacha Kukkucha. Why I say it should be Kukkucha Uddhacha? Kukkucha is uh, inner worry, worrying. We worry for various things. And when we worry, we become restless. And that is why these two also go together and put together in the way. Then restlessness and worry is uh, compared to water with ripples. When water is ripply, uh, having full of ripples, you cannot see what is inside. The second simile is a heap of dust. When you throw a rock to a huge heap of dust, the dust will be stirred up and scatter all over, blocking your view. <laughs> you cannot see things when uh, dust is raised. So then you worry. Suppose you are driving, all of a sudden dust arises. You know, yesterday we visited the man. We, we told you that he was uh, dying. He gave, gave us a very good uh, point in our discussions. He said, mm, he, he just can talk uh, but he remembers some of the incidents in his life. One incident, he said, uh, he's uh, using his uh, big uh, tractor, like caterpillar, to uh, make a road. And all of a sudden, the, the fume from the, uh, what do you call, the diesel engine, came out so huge, such a big volume of smoke came out, and entire things was blocked out, and he, he was knocked down. <laughs> Remember that? At that time, he certainly was worried, he could not do anything, he could not say anything, he simply fell on the ground. This is how when restlessness and worry arise in our mind. We get so confused. We don't know what to do. We simply stop. We cannot proceed. The last hindrance is doubt. Doubt is compared to traveling in a desert. 
where there are no roads, no signs, no directions, no people, you get totally doubtful, confused. You don't know where to go. Now, <coughs> then Buddha gave examples of how the, the, these hindrances arise. And also Buddha said these hindrances, before I uh, explain the way how they arise, These uh, five hindrances become active when five other factors become sleepy, or they go to when there are five other factors are asleep. These five factors become active. Buddha said. Uh, Pancha jagarang sutta, pancha sutte su jagara, pancha hi rajang adeti, pancha hi parisujati. That is, five are asleep when others are awake. Five are awake when others are asleep. By five things one gathers dust, by five things one is purified. You can find it in Sangyutta Nikaya. That is when five hindrances are uh, awake, their opposites are asleep. When they are opposite, are awake, five hindrances are asleep. So Buddha said five are dust collectors and other five purify the dust. So hindrances arise <coughs> For sensual pleasure, for instance, when objects are visual, sound, smell, taste, touch, and thought, happen to be pleasant, then sense desire arises. That is very natural. Also, I want to uh, make a, a statement of caution for people to uh, keep in mind whenever we talk about hindrances, they should not become, uh, they should not feel guilty about it. They should not blame themselves for having hindrances. People, we all must understand we, Buddha was talking about the nature of our mind. And we are not sinners. This, this we must always remember. Whenever we talk about hindrances, many people get very upset. Why? Because that reminds them the teaching they have learned in other traditions. They think they are sinners. We are trying to pinpoint, we are trying to uh, remind them of their sin. In Buddhist tradition, no matter what uh, defilement we talk about, we are not talking about sins. Buddha always talk about the nature of our mind. This is a universal nature of our mind. And we always must know this is what I have and this is what I have to work with. 
not to feel guilty, not to feel depressed, not to blame anybody, not to curse ourselves, uh, or any, to do any kind of negative, uh, to have any negative reaction to these things. <coughs> so whenever we say sense desire arises, when there is a pleasant object, what is wrong with that? <laughs> Buddha said, uh, remember, per particularly because of this, Buddha said to Vendabal Ananda, when Ananda asked uh, Bhante, uh, Vendabal Ananda was the one who was always uh, dealing with women. Every day he went to give the sermon, went to the palace to give sermons to women. And yet, he still did not know how to deal with women. So he asked the Buddha, Sir, Venerable Sir, how can we deal with women? Buddha said, don't look at them. If we happen to see them, Buddha said, don't talk to them. If they ask a question, if they had to talk, if we had to talk, speak only four words. <laughs> These four words are enough. <laughs> what are the four words? Dukkha, Samudha, Nirodha, Magga. <laughs> eh? Suffering, cause of suffering, end of suffering, path leading to the end of suffering. You can talk these four words to anybody, <laughs> not only to women. But why the Buddha asked Ananda, don't look at them? Because not women are ugly or repulsive or loathsome, just the other way around. Women are attractive, beautiful. Tantalizing, tempting, and that is why you should not look at them. Don't listen to their vo voice. Don't touch them. Don't smell them. Don't think of them. Purely because they are beautiful, attractive, pleasant, tempting, and uh, arousing uh, our desire. So, when uh, we, the same thing of course for women, Buddha said, uh, women should not, if you are uh, living as a, a monastic, uh, you want to guard your senses, uh, don't look at the man, don't think of the man, don't enjoy his voice and so forth, because uh, men are attractive to women. <coughs> and because these are, these are called pleasant objects, pleasant objects to our eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body and mind. Because of these pleasant objects, greed can arise in man and greed can arise in a woman. And this is, Buddha did not say this is a sin. This is the nature of our mind. And if we want to uh, make mind calm, peaceful, relaxed, put these thoughts aside. Put these thoughts aside temporarily. Don't think of them. Don't look at them. Don't talk to them. Don't associate with them, don't touch them, just stay away from them. You can do it for an hour, two hours, three hours, one day, two days, three days, five days, a week, a month. You have to make your own program, how long you are going to do that. <laughs> that is the gradual tra training of the mind and the Buddha's method. So, uh, sensual desire arises. Now, 
whenever we talk about hindrances, we have to look at the whole universal picture. Not only one single moment of sitting on the cushion. These hindrances can arise any time, any day, any place, in any posture. They can arise because we have these six senses. So, whenever they arise, wherever they arise, then we have to see how they arose. They arose because of this pleasant object. Pleasant objects are everywhere. And their hindrance arise. <coughs> so, uh, first I show you how, how the Buddha explained the way how they arise and then I uh, explain how we uh, nourish them, support them, maintain them. And then I show you how to get rid of them. So let me go through this uh, way how they arise. So first I define what the hindrances are. Second I show you how they arise. Third I uh, give you a way of how they, how we nourish them, support them, maintain them and lastly how to get rid of them. Four stages. And all these four stages you can find in sutras. <coughs> so the number two hindrance is ill will. How does it arise? This is very interesting. Ill will arise uh, so long as there is a sign of, rep of the repulsion. Sign of the repulsion. Particular manasikara. Very beautiful, very important subject to remember. Any object, sight, sound, smell, taste, touch and the thought. Any object in our mind we think to be repulsive, you know, sometimes a person appears to be very handsome, very beautiful, attractive. In however, in somebody's mind, there will be uh, a thought of repulsion towards that person. It doesn't ha the person doesn't have to be uh, ugly, unpleasant <coughs> in appearance, but the 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 perceivers. In the perceiver's mind, there will be a, some very settled idea. For instance, we all know racism. Racism. People's color has nothing to do with racism. Sometimes people appear to be appear to be attractive, have a color, have a. Uh, attractive color and yet the person who perceives the person think that this person comes from such and such an ethnic origin. That thought can make, can create anger, ill will in the mind. Uh, sometimes somebody may be uh, of the same ethnic group and yet the person might have done something to this person in the past and remembering uh, somebody else resembling this person, that person reminds the one who has done something wrong to you. Then anger rises. Not to speak of uh, ugly object. Uh, inanimate object. And there is a meditation, I have emphasized it many times, it's very important to remember, particular manasikara, meditation. Unattractiveness of the body. It has nothing to do with the outer appearance. 
one would uh, reflect on one's own inner uh, parts of the body. By reflecting on inner parts of the body, there can arise anger if one is not cautious and mindful. Remember we mentioned uh, all these we must pull together to understand the meaning of this hindrance. We mentioned of uh, uh, many monks committing suicide by reflecting on various parts of the body. I don't know whether you remember this uh, story. Uh, it is uh, reported in the sutras. Uh, particularly uh, Kaya Gata Sati Sutta where Buddha explained the parts of the body and asked monks to contemplate on them and went away on his own personal retreat. When he returned many monks disappeared. So when Ananda, Buddha asked Ananda, Ananda what happened? He said, sir, you thought uh, this body is uh, unattractive and asked the monks to contemplate on 32 parts of the body. They practiced it, they felt so repulsive, so got, they got so angry, they committed suicide. Many of them committed suicide. So the, uh, also Buddha said, particular object, particular nimitta, Particular nimitta. The word nimitta means sign. Sign of unattractiveness is the cause of anger, ill will. That unattractiveness, sign of unattractiveness can be of the body or the sound. If the sound is so irritating, you know, penetrating into your bones, very irritating sound, you get angry. Smell, if it is smell, is very unpleasant, get angry. When the touch is not pleasant, we get angry. When the taste is not good, we get angry. I remember once, um, it was very uh, impolite, of course, but uh, we had a friend, uh, when somebody served food, if the person doesn't like the food, the person, you know, take it from the mouth into his hand and throw it and uh, spitting out in front of the people who offered this food. <laughs> so some people do that. The taste is no good, person gets angry, so throw it away. Anyway, the thought of somebody or something which is unpleasant, anger rises. So the cause of anger is a repulsive, sign of repulsiveness, sign of repulsiveness. That means we assign that sign to the object. Object itself may not have that sign. Because every object will not arouse anger in everybody. An object may arouse anger in one person, the same ob object can arouse joy and happiness in another person. So the, the sign of uh, repulsiveness is not on the object, but in the mind. You create the sign of repulsiveness on the object. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, perverted, okay. per, perverted, per, per, uh, perverted perception. Oh, okay. You are what is called vipalasa, distorted perception. Uh, the sign of repulsiveness is uh, uh, really a distorted perception. You know, I'm going to give the, the 
the remedy to overcome this one by one. So you are a step ahead of my <laughs> explanation. So I gave uh, four stages. Your stage is the number three, number third stage. Okay. The the third uh, hindrance. Uh, how the third hindrance arises? In fact, uh, uh, third hindrance arises according to the Buddha's explanation because of discontent, lethargy, lazy stretching, drowsiness after meals, sluggishness of mind. Uh, these are the causes of sleepiness and drowsiness. Now, discontent. You are not satisfied. It is boring. It is monotonous. Tiring. You cannot relate. It is not stimulating. The object is not stimulating enough. Uh, you know, children sleep in the class because the subject, e even the subject is interesting, the teacher cannot make it interesting. The students fall asleep. The music is so uh, sometimes uh, uh, so soothing, so comforting, you fall asleep. On the one hand, it you, f you fall asleep because of the object is uh, so boring, tiring, uh, monotonous. On the other hand, object happens to be so soothing, comforting, relaxing, you, it would lulls you to sleep. You fall asleep. Another reason, of course, is uh, uh, lethargy. Lethargic condition can be caused by uh, lethargy is the reason for drowsiness, but that itself can be caused by something else. For instance, if somebody takes drugs as a medicine, especially these days, most of the medication that are recommended to people for various diseases make you lethargic, drowsy, sleepy. You cannot take uh, uh, any, any medicine for allergy, you feel drowsy. You cannot take any medicine for stomach upset, you feel drowsy. So sometimes artificial agents, chemicals can create drowsiness, sleepiness. Another cause is laziness by nature because of the chemical imbalance in the body. Some people become lazy. That is not a sin. That is not a crime. This body is not theirs. None of our bodies is ours. <laughs> if if my, this body is mine, I should be able to do anything I want. It something happens to the body inside, and that some, that sometimes will be chemical imbalance, hormone imbalance, thyroid imbalance, and so forth. Various imbalances in our four, four elements. This body is made up of four elements, and these elements, in our ancient, uh, very down to earth philosophers, medical people uh, attribute all our sicknesses to imbalance of these four elements in the body. That is true. Only today they begin to re realize because of the imbalance of chemistry in the brain, such and such a thing happens. What is this imbalance? Imbalance of the four elements. That is not our fault. <laughs> we don't make it imbalance. It happens. Uh, why I mention this repeatedly? Because sometimes people feel guilty again, even about the costs of hindrances, not only hindrances. 
Now I am talking about the causes. Uh, when we talk about hindrances, people get upset, feel guilty. When we talk about the cause of hindrances, people get upset and guilty. Buddha did not meant that. He wanted just he just wanted to present facts. This is a fact. You fall sick, and you don't have to feel guilty about it. You fall sick because certain things happen. You don't know, so you have to take care of it. Exactly like a very compassionate physician, he points out the causes of our problems. Then, drowsiness after meals. Definitely we feel drowsy, we have to eat. Especially, you know, when you work very hard, you are very hungry, you definitely eat a lot of food. That is not something wrong, you have to eat. Laborers, for instance, working very hard in fields, when they eat large amount of food, they have to take a nap. That is not considered to be something um, criminal. Then sluggishness of mind, that also is due to lack of sleep, physical tiredness, and uh, you know reading, uh, writing, working very hard for long period of time, people have uh, sluggishness of the mind. So these are the causes of sleepiness and drowsiness. For the restlessness and worry, uh, Buddha simply has mentioned unsettled mind. Uh, unsettled mind, some other places have is explained as uh, you have done something incomplete. You could not complete it. And you keep worrying about it. Or you have made a mistake. Whenever you remember that, you worry about it. Or you anticipate doing something and you want to do it properly. Uh, and you worry about it. I remember once I was traveling with a Japanese. Uh, he was supposed to be my interpreter in Japan. And on the train, this man began to throw up. And he came and uh, apologized to me. He said, Bhante, last whole night I could not sleep. Why? I was so worrying about how to do my translation work. He has never done translation and he has never seen me before. He was assigned to translate my talks into Japanese. And he was worrying and worrying a whole night. Next day he was full of restlessness and started throwing up. That has that can happen. So unsettled state of mind. Uh, no any other specific uh, point is mentioned, but everywhere we can see uns unsettled state of mind. Unsettled st state of mind can happen due to many, 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 many things with regard to the family, with regard to job, with regard to studies, with regard to driving, with regard to translation, with regard to anything that we have not completed and we are not sure what we are going to do and so forth and so on can cause uh, restlessness and worry. And the last hindrance is doubt. Doubt is uh, also caused by, Buddha said, basis for doubt. That is, there is no specific cause given, doubtful situation. When you say doubtful situation, that can be anything. Any statement you make can be doubtful. Any place where you, where you go, things are not uh, you know, arranged in a proper order, and you begin to doubt uh, as to what you should do, where you sit, and how you behave, and what is the next uh, you know, item, and so forth. Uh, you don't know, so you have a doubt. 
Sometimes teaching is so confusing, so you have doubt. Uh, so Buddha kept it open and said, any doubtful situation can cause doubt. And that also is not a fault or crime. And whenever somebody had doubts and went to the Buddha, he said, you have a reason to be doubtful. Now let me explain the Dhamma. So he explained the Dhamma to, uh, to, to clear his doubts. So friends, now we have a little break. May not be more than 10 minutes. Please come back exactly in 10 minutes. Whether you come at 10 minutes or not, I will talk to these chairs and cushions. <laughs> After 10 minutes. <laughs> okay.